director and nobody else can can interfere, get involved with uh, 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 the powers of the commissioner over SARS. Uh, next slide. So, as I said, the key issues are around governance and strengthening the organizational leadership, the role of an inspectorate, the um, need for an executive committee. There's a proposal there to have at least one deputy commissioner. Uh, um, uh, it's not in favor of an oversight board. Uh, the Davis Tax Committee had a different approach. So there's very different views on the role of a board. Um, I think even in our own discussions, it's something we we still engaging on. And finally, when we do come out with the policy paper, I think we'll put the pros and cons because there are reasons either way, I think, to consider. I think that the commission also affirmed the role of the office of the tax ombud. And as I said, that is quite different from that of the inspector general. I know that uh, the, the current chair, the judge, uh, has, uh, uh, I mean, has raised the issue of should it not be combined. But I think when we've looked at it, we don't think that the two should be combined. They're very different responsibilities. Um, yeah, we can move on. But these are just initial thoughts, Chair. We definitely come up with a paper to put the pros and cons on all of these things, which we hope to get published by uh, uh, budget board. day. Um, um, I think uh, even in our own discussions, uh, it's something we we still. So it's not June. I should say that we want to get finally the discussion when we do document a budget day and take comments and so on by June. Come out with the policy. Uh, oh, sorry, but I think we, we had put the pros and cons to doing it this year. And as the DM said, Deputy Minister said, uh, this was simply not possible with all the COVID tax codes are, that we did, for example, example, the way I think a lot of work we did. I, if you remember, the tax system kicked in uh, I think very that early the on. The commission also the, affirmed the role of the uh, response of the tax to COVID. Next slide. And as I said, that is quite different from that of so the chair, inspector this is general. The I know that, that we have, and it's. Uh, 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 I'm very happy the committee is forcing us to give you timelines. The, the um, current chair, so the judge, that, uh, has, uh, we'd certainly be uh, able I to mean, release a, a the issue the discussion of paper that combines but by I budget think day. Um, it will then take us a month or two to process those things and that the two should be combined. I'm very, very different that uh, we can provide um, the minister draft legislation then for comment uh, uh, between June and September, uh, hopefully around the TLEP process and the Minister of Finance will get the cabinet approval then to release it uh, for public comment first and then to have it tabled later in a year and to bring it to the committee uh, towards the end of next year in the in the last quarter. And an optimistic scenario is that it could be passed by the end of next year. Um, but typically these things take a bit longer, but I don't think we should delay beyond, beyond June. We've looked at 2022. I think, Chair, I think that the two I'll should be combined. They're very um, different I think that's responsibilities. Um, yeah, we can move on. But these are just initial thoughts, Chair. We definitely Thank you, come Chair. up with a paper to put the pros and cons on all of these things, which we hope uh, to get published uh, by uh, uh, Over uh, to budget. you, all um, um, I think uh, even in our and, own discussions, uh, it's something we... Good morning, we, So it's uh, not Chair true. And I should uh, say that we want to get find you a new document by budget um, day I will take go comments and so on by June. Come out with uh, uh, oh, sorry, but with we had the pros and cons to doing it this year. And as the DM said, Minister said. Uh, so we have previously chair, shared some of the updates with the with the committee. Um, so this is just a further update and progress that we have made. Um, but I will also just run through all of the recommendations just to give a coherent uh, feedback chair. Um, so I think Mr. Namonia touched on on this, but this just affirms the fact that the recommendation for SARS was um, an autonomous institution 
independent uh, with because it envisaged that SARS needed certain um, capabilities that it would not be able to build um, and achieve if it was simply part of the uh, of the uh, uh, public service. Uh, the other important thing I thought I should point out, uh, because I come back to that later, is that the commissioner is appointed by by the president, uh, but works under the policy guidelines of the minister. The commissioner also has in law um, a mandate to advise the minister on matters concerning tax revenue and to advise the minister of trade and industry on matters of import and export. And then SARS is funded um, according to the estimate to be determined in a manner that has to be agreed between the minister and the commissioner and ultimately approved by parliament. This is an area because it comes back to the work of rebuilding SARS. And then once funds has been appropriated to SARS, um, it has to be uh, determined and managed in agreement with uh, uh, between SARS and the minister subject to the PFMA. Now, Coming therefore to the state of SARS, I think it's important that whilst we will today report to you on progress against the Nugent recommendations, that if one goes through the diagnostic as presented by Nugent, the work that is required in the rebuilding of SARS is significantly more than just the narrow implementation of the recommendations. And that's quite important that um, the, the work we are currently engaged in, in the Nugent Commission recommendations is uh, important, um, very important, but not sufficient to engage in the project of rebuilding SARS into a capable revenue authority, capable of providing the state its resources um, and to manage uh, the legitimate trade across its borders and to ensure a highly compliant tax base. And I think it's important that the committee um, just zooms out and sees that the project we are currently engaged in is significantly more than what Nugent says. Um, but since we have to report on Nugent, we will. Um, and I think we have seen the slide before um, a, a, a summary or a pricey of the Nugent diagnostic um, referred to a failure of governance and integrity, the so-called Bain operating model uh, that was deliberately sought to render the organization incapable of fulfilling its mandate. It manifested in a number of ways. Uh, examples of that was uh, the dismantling of the large business center of other units within SARS, including the High Court litigation unit and the capacity to deal with the illicit economy was severely compromised uh, also during the unfortunate narrative uh, that uh, emerged uh, between uh, subject or, or after uh, 2014. Um, the SARS modernization program took, became a huge casualty of this and we are paying the price of that today. We continue to be under uh, um, an underinvestment in this, and this will, will, will continue to hamper the organization for years to come. Um, significant impact on senior employees who were either exited or marginalized um, and a significantly weakened leadership. That then resulted in the three declining trends that we have seen, a decline in revenue performance internally in employee morale and confidence and externally in public confidence. Um, internally, we observed um, the high levels of trauma and distrust uh, by amongst leaders. Uh, we had to deal with specific integrity challenges at the level of leadership. Uh, many people were in jobs that they weren't necessarily suited for, and there was generally just a decline in performance. Uh, and then in capability, uh, we see the numbers of, of actual people in technical 
uh, roles that had exited throughout that period. Um, I want to now go, Chair, to the uh, specific recommendations. Nugent um, ex explicitly records 16 recommendations, which we break down into 27 uh, sub-recommendations. Of those, um, 10 of it falls into the National Treasury mandate, the purpose of Mr. Mamoniet's uh, um, presentation earlier, and, and the others are within the uh, domain of SARS. And uh, you, we will share with you this morning that 14 of those recommendations have been implemented and another five are in various degrees of progress. I'm not going to go through the detail of the ones we have covered before, but I will just mention uh, to you, Chair, that in terms of the overall uh, procurement issues, um, many of them from our perspective have been implemented. Um, we are also pleased to say that we have strengthened um, our procurement function within SARS by the recent appointment of a new um, chief procurement officer within SARS, which we hope will also strengthen the relationship between SARS um, procurement and the CPO's office uh, within uh, National Treasury. Uh, we have re-established the large business center um, and also uh, add, busy adding alongside that an independent unit that will focus on uh, wealthy individuals. Um, we are renaming uh, the large business center as uh, the business segment, large and international businesses. And for individuals, it will be uh, the individual segment for wealthy individuals uh, and individuals with complex financial arrangements. Um, we've re-established the litigation office and, and appointed a chief litigation officer, uh, and we've re-established the compliance unit. Um, the important issue uh, uh, is uh, still uh, something that is uh, in progress. It is to strengthen our capability within the technology, uh, information and technology area. Um, and there we still have to make some senior appointments. Um, uh, the supernumerary position, you will recall there were about 60 of these positions. All of them have been placed um, and we have changed our philosophy to EXCO by broadening the involvement, by giving more people the opportunity to be involved in the organization. We have flattened the leadership uh, level, but most importantly, we have uh, reviewed every one of the senior leaders and we have dealt with the integrity issues that the report pointed us to. Um, in terms of the remuneration of, of members, uh, benefits for EXCO members, um, for now, as we said, uh, we are following, there were split uh, opinions on this, but for now we are following the conservative opinion by um, working with the Minister of Finance in terms of benefits uh, for uh, senior executives that sit on EXCO. Um, the anti-corruption uh, capacity, we have reestablished a division uh, that is uh, focuses on the illicit and criminal activities. Um, in terms of the operational investigation um, on, on issues such as that, the review is taken, uh, but there's still, the basic implementation is done, but it's an ongoing process to strengthen the integrity of our refund system, because sadly, uh, we still have a continued attack on our refund system by elements that are criminal, that have no intention to trade other than to extract benefit from the... So, so that really is one of those issues where the work is ongoing and we cannot uh, uh, declare victory. Uh, in terms of um, uh, re reference bodies to, to settle claims, you may remember that there was a dismantling of some of the capacities there uh, and the erstwhile commissioner um, became involved directly and personally in, uh, in settling claims. We have addressed that. Uh, there are now um, very, very clear settlement committees 
uh, and the current commissioner is not a member of any of the settlement commission uh, committees and will only uh, for any approval where the decision is made and a delegation of, uh, of authority is required, the commissioner will become involved, but, uh, but, but the commissioner is substantively not involved in any of the committees that uh, settles debt uh, or uh, any other outstanding obligation by taxpayers. Um, the issue of, of uh, media statements have been substantively dealt with. The relationships with other state institutions, I can share with the committee very encouragingly, uh, chair and members, that we have a very, very good um, mm -hmm. active working relationship with the NPA, the FIC, uh, the Hawks, the SIU, um, as well as uh, our colleagues in National Treasury and the Auditor General. Um, and so all of those matters uh, we believe we, SARS has been actively involved during the COVID period as a member of NAT joints, as a member of the JCPS cluster, as a member of the economic cluster. So we really are actively involved um, with the rest of government as, as colleagues. Um, we've established relationships with our OECD colleagues uh, and are now invited to speak and to contribute towards working teams um, and at other international gatherings. And this is very helpful in two ways. Firstly, it reestablished the SARS as a peer in the international uh, uh, community of tax uh, revenue authorities and governments, uh, but it also gives us access to our colleagues to learn to do benchmarks and to accelerate our own learning. Those are the recommendations that are uh, implemented. Then those that are currently in, in Progress, Chair, uh, we have handed a number of matters over to the uh, uh, Director of Priority uh, Crimes and the SIU and the, uh, and the NPA. Um, and there it is now out of our hands. And so we're waiting a recommendation by the Hawks in that regard. Um, as far as the Gartner contacts are concerned, we have initiated negotiations with Gartner uh, we were supposed to have an on, uh, a follow-up visit and ongoing discussions, um, which for now has been placed on pause. Um, and uh, we didn't believe that the last recommendation, which they made early in this year, was one that we would consider. Um, so we will have to re-engage with them. Um, we have uh, issued letters of demand for monies we believe uh, the former commission, uh, commissioner um, uh, owes SARS uh, and uh, we will continue to follow up that money uh, which we believe is lawfully due to SARS. In terms of case selection uh, and audit protocols, Chair, case selection is a very important function in SARS because it is how SARS decides it wants to select an individual or an entity for an audit or for any other investigative work. It is important that this is done in a manner that is beyond reproach, that SARS can never be accused of acting in any other way other than without fear, without favor, and without prejudice. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you are a township dweller a member of parliament, a CEO of a business, a member of cabinet or the president, in terms of how we administer our law, it has to be uh, within a very, very high integrity environment. So we have reviewed this and we've expanded it, but also increasingly the use of data, artificial intelligence and technology will help us uh, to select the correct cases because there is no upside in getting this wrong in any way. Uh, and then the last uh, in progress uh, uh, chair, uh, which is uh, really in addition to the supernumerary post, there was a number of staff who would have claimed that they were compromised or negatively impacted on because of certain actions um, during the period 2014 to about 2018, and uh, 
We have substantively reviewed all of those who are internal. We have set up a listening campaign uh, led by uh, a pastoral approach to allow people to come forward and speak. Um, we have um, looked at bringing back a few individuals who had specialist knowledge who could help us with the rebuilding process uh, and recruited some of these people as full-time employees also in new positions. Uh, we have engaged with KPMG. Um, you will recall that we recently announced a decision that SARS has taken uh, in respect of the Sikakani report and the KPMG report, the conclusion after extensive review uh, of the reports itself, uh, our independent application of our mind and taking legal counsel we have arrived at the decision that we can no longer place reliance on the KPMG report, as well as on the Sikikana report. We informed the authors of the decision of SARS um, and KPMG, uh, I have to uh, say, I am encouraged that they have uh, expressed a willingness to work with SARS to address some of the reparation issues. Um, and so we are currently involved with um, a, a few more of the internal issues, but they have been largely addressed. Uh, but, and then uh, we have also commenced reparation of uh, former employees. Um, and I have begun to meet with those, some of those employees uh, to begin a process of review and reparation. Um, Chair then, as I said, whilst we are reporting on the specific recommendation our response has to be significantly broader because the real project is not to implement the recommendations of the Nugent report on itself, but to engage and initiate a process of rebuilding SARS to what it needs to be. And so these are some of the matters that constitute that wider approach. The first is the rebuilding of SARS to institutional integrity. That is an end-to-end -end review, leaving no stone untouched, how we manage our processes, how we manage debt, how we conduct audits, uh, how we manage our border posts, um, how we, uh, our excise and customs operations. So it's the entire end-to-end -end functioning of SARS that we have to address. If not, it's like removing cancer from one part of the, of the body but leaving it to fester in another part of the body, the whole body will become sick again. The, the second is very important. SARS cannot be successful if it does not have the public confidence and trust. This is a huge issue. It doesn't just affect SARS because when the public loses confidence in government, it also loses confidence in SARS because SARS is seen as a part of government and therefore this has to be a whole of government approach to gain public confidence, but SARS is committed to do its part uh, as far as that is concerned. The committee will also remember there was an issue around whether or not SARS has certain powers. I want to confirm unequivocally, uh, Chair, that, and we have made this clear within SARS, that we will work strictly within the powers that is endowed uh, into the commission of managing SARS as is set out in the Tax Administration Act, the Customs Act, um, and we have clarified that with a senior council opinion, where and when and for what purposes SARS may gather intelligence or information. Um, and that is confirmed as part of our governance framework within SARS, um, and we will continue to monitor against that. Uh, the recent report of the Inspector General uh, having been re uh, withdrawn um, further confirms SARS's position in this regard. Uh, Chair, and I want to say that the message to any of our staff is we will not tolerate any behavior by any member of SARS. They will not have any protection by SARS if they step outside of that which is prescribed in law. It is a red card offense when members do not honor um, that which is required of us to do in law. The confidentiality of taxpayer information is another huge issue. 
and it's often contested in the public domain for reasons that only those who contest it will can explain. Um, you will be aware of the member between SARS and the public protector. Um, this is not awaiting court ruling um, um, because it challenges chapter six provisions uh, and we will await uh, the outcome of the court in this regard. Um, I spoke about the KPMG and the Sikakana reports, um, spoke about the establishment of a high net worth individual unit um, and the ongoing enhancement of our customs operation. This was an area that was hugely neglected, but we have begun to re-engage with the World Customs Organization with local stakeholders to establish the authorized economic operator unit. And all of this modernization uh, chair now becomes very important, especially as we're entering the uh, a period of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, mutual administration agreements with our partners uh, across our borders, um, single windows, information exchange, and all of those modernization efforts now become more than ever important. Otherwise, we continue to compromise um, the, um, the integrity of, of the work we do. The, on the rebuilding of SARS, um, beyond simply what Nugent tells us to do, uh, we continue to engage with our staff. Our, our staff is our biggest strength, but also our biggest weakness. If we don't manage and fully engage them, instill within them a, a, a sense of professionalism, but also a sense of pride. Um, the ongoing engagement with stakeholders, we have, you will, if you look at our nine strategic objective, uh, st strategic objective eight is very explicit that we need stakeholders to be successful and strategic objective nine <laughs> speaks to our reliance on public confidence as an important plank in building a relationship with the public that enhances our impact and uh, the fulfillment of our mandate. We have also, as we have shared with you earlier on, reimagined SARS. We launched a new strategy based on a clear vision and strategic intent. We've begun to rearrange the way we work so that we can be more effective. We have a specific focus on the revenue recovery program. We have reactivated the Davis Tax Committee and will shortly be um, uh, ready to hand the reports of this uh, done between SARS and the Commission and the Judge Davis uh, to the Minister for approval and then for uh, for public consumption. After that, um, then there is obviously the rebuilding of a capable leadership system within SARS. Uh, I am not going to go through this, but just to remind you, this is the work we have done and I've already shared with you so that we, you can have the confidence that while we are busy putting in place all of the blocks, the building blocks, and this is a challenge at the moment because of the times in which we live, government is constrained for funds, this impacts SARS, SARS is not yet the employer of choice it needs to be, but notwithstanding those challenges, we proceed with clarity of what has to be done. Um, and we have shared that uh, with you previously. Um, we, we have moved from a functional organization where we have separate silos for tax service, taxpayer service for enforcement and for customs uh, which has meant that we frustrate taxpayers often because the one silo doesn't know what the other silo does. Uh, we have not, we have let ourselves down by not always honoring our compliance model. Um, and we have not followed through on really international best practices, which SARS itself had committed to, but never really fully implemented principles such as segmentation, a differentiated apply, compliance approach, um, and to reduce the involvement of head office in the day-to-day -day running of SARS. And head office role is more to give strategic uh, uh, guidance, to allocate resources, and to hold the regions accountable for performance, but not to become the stumbling block in performance. Uh, and so that's really what the new arrangement seeks to address. As you can see on slide 31, um, that therefore is the, the, the current way 
in which we are organized, empowered regions close to the taxpayers uh, so that we can have shorter turnaround times to resolve those issues um, supported by uh, um, uh, either enabling or other uh, operational functions to make the work more efficient. Uh, so that's really our new organizational arrangements. We've shared this before, so I won't spend time on it. And then within SARS, we have created the following committee structures um, that just strengthens um, the day-to-day -day governance uh, of this. So you'll see, uh, in addition to the cluster committees, there are there's a national revenue committee, there's the regional directors forum for taxpayer engagement, there's an enforcement committee that has oversight of all enforcement action, even though it takes place in different uh, functional divisions. There's the customs committee that has end-to-end -end oversight of customs. There's the people committee that looks at people issues and the governance and risk committee. So that's really the committee structure. Each of these with a terms of reference, uh, with a chair that's been allocated um, and membership that represents all the functions um, to ensure a uh, chair that we remain uh, within a very healthy uh, framework that gives the highest level of assurance of governance within SARS. Uh, clearly, uh, there is a lot of work still has to be done to get all of these committees to function well, uh, to be properly capacitated. Um, and as time goes on, we will um, accelerate our learning to make it more efficient. I want to end by coming back to our strategic intent, the nine clear objectives. And again, as I said at the, at the commencement uh, chair, uh, this is a response more uh, broader uh, because when you opened up uh, this uh, session chair, you spoke about the primary function of SARS to ultimately con collect revenue and that as we have shared before, this has been severely compromised by a weakened SARS, then further aggravated by a declining economy and a kind of another nail uh, that as uh, we've all had to deal with uh, given COVID. And it is therefore important that we, we have to raise the concern to this committee that this current project will not succeed at the current funding levels. We are engaging uh, later today, in fact, with uh, the Deputy Minister and our colleagues in Treasury uh, to point this out one more time. Uh, and, and here's some graphs that just bears that out. The, the blue line is the tax revenue. The red is the GDP. And the line says in a healthy economy, you want the buoyancy ratio to be higher than one, which means that the tax revenue performance is higher than the GDP performance. So you'll see, for example, in 2004, 2005, the GDP nominally was 11.2%, the tax revenue was 17%. So the ratio was 1.55. And so you can see that ratio in the period 2004, to about 2007, eight was always higher than one. Then we had the 2008 crisis, South Africa went into recession and you'll see that the revenue contracted uh, relative to the GDP for those two years. Then as we recovered 2010, it went back to 1.18, 1.13, 1.22, 1 1.2. That's an evidence of a healthy SARS, not an optimal SARS because we can do much better than that uh, because of our low levels of compliance, but that's an important indicator for you to address your concern, Chair, and I'm sure the, chair, the, the concern of, of the committee members about the performance of SARS. When you then look um, at the period that we've then entered into, we see that there was a significant uh, reduction in the cost of SARS. I think initially, uh, because the, the concern about the integrity at SARS and the ability to spend that money wisely, but we have currently, as I will show you, uh, continued to, to allocate funding to SARS, which is inadequate to its mandate. 
Um, in fact, if we had continued the funding trend, SARS would currently be funded at, at more than 14 billion as opposed to the 10.2 billion. Um, and so you can see, therefore, because of that, um, you will also see that there's international best practice that says SARS, uh, a, a good revenue authority should be funded at about 1% of its revenue. Um, and SARS is currently well below that 1% uh, of that revenue, 0.73% before the special adjustment budget, uh, significantly below uh, the international benchmark of 1%. So what has that caused? Now you can see from 2014, there's a steady decline of that buoyancy ratio. In 2014, it was still, um, it was still above one, um, and then the decline starts. So by 2016, 17, it's at 0.97. Um, then you'll see it goes all the way down to, uh, uh, there, there has been a little blip in 2017, 18, uh, and that was largely because of the 1% VAT um, increase uh, that gives a little bit of a blip. Otherwise, that trend would have continued. Um, and then uh, you see uh, in, in 2019, the beginning of a, uh, 1920, the beginning of that ratio being turned around. So last year in a GDP, nominally expanding by 4.6%, SARS was able to collect 7.1%. Uh, um, and that begins to also show you that if we have focus on revenue recovery, focusing on the right actions to address the weaknesses within SARS, there is money in the economy that is under collected. We know that because of the increase in criminal activities, we know that because of the declining compliance levels, and therefore it would really be um, quite a, a, a unfortunate situation if SARS cannot give effect to its mandate because of an inappropriate funding uh, arrangement. Um, you can see there, um, I'm not sure uh, if you are looking at your screen, but you'll see in 2013-14, the actual grant received by SARS was nine and a half billion. The headcount of SARS was 14 and uh, just over 14,000. If you run your eyes along, you'll see that in 1920, in last year, our funding was the same almost as the funding in 2013, nine and a half billion um, with 12, just over 12,000 employees. So, so you can see that something is seriously wrong. Now, we have empathy that the whole of government is resource constrained, but we would make a strong argument here to say that SARS is not a cost center in government. SARS is a revenue center. It's an investment center. And every cent that you allocate to SARS comes back with a multiplier eventually of between 10 to 100, depending on the area that you do. So not to ensure the adequate funding of SARS places a huge compromise ultimately on our fiscal uh, integrity. This graph shows you how we have begun to not invest in uh, the capital platform. This is the IT technology. It's the refresh of our basic infrastructure. In 2013, 2014, uh, we had um, uh, uh, well over uh, 1.3, uh, trillion of investment, and that has come all, all the way down uh, last year to just over 300 million. We cannot continue on this trend. Um, if, we, if we have to continue, we will simply uh, uh, share with you, committee, that we are fighting a losing battle. Um, the current approach has resulted in an inability to replace critical skills that are essential to the effective and efficient functioning of SARS, the inability to maintain the current technology infrastructure for successive years now already, a significant underinvestment in the modernization of SARS in a context which is fast evolving. We are unable to do any forward planning because we have no funding certainty. National Treasury at any point in time can say we're taking away another 200 million. 
so not even the funding that we have at the beginning of the year is certain. So we can't plan anything forward. We've also compromised our value proposition, which has allowed us in the past to attract and to reward the scarce talent that is necessary to give effect to our mandate. And so we humbly submit, Chair, that the overall effect of underfunding SARS has resulted in a material negative impact on the institutional integrity of SARS in its capability to, re to, to give effect to its revenue collection mandate, and ultimately, therefore, to the fiscal integrity of South Africa. The cheapest money available to us is tax money. In the absence of that, we are borrowing money and therefore spending hard-earned money to service our debt rather than investing it in social programs and in much needed areas of infrastructure. So, so, uh, so, so Chair, I will pause there um, and, and hand back to my colleagues in Treasury. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Commissioner. Uh, Deputy Minister, is there any other officials who still have to make presentation? No, th thanks, Chair. I think uh, we, we're done for now. we we'll, um, willing to take questions, comments, and guidance from yourselves. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, Alan, you will assist me with the uh, uh, honorable members who would like to ask clarity seeking questions and also make uh, comments. Uh, My screen this side is not properly functioning. I can see honorable Shbambu. Um, Louis, is it the only three that we have on the screen? Honorable Shbambo, Kosana, Louis. Yes, For now, it's who's through? Um. Oh, okay. Let's start with the uh, okay. Honorable Shibambu, over to you. No, thank you very much, uh, Chair. There are just a few issues that we want to point out because it looks like part of this presentation that was made here is to smuggle some narratives which are not necessarily a reflection of reality. One of those narratives which is being smuggled here is that the appointment of the current SARS commissioner was transparent. It was not. It was not appointed transparently. There was a secret committee, which amongst other things, had Trevor Manuel, a, 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 who had vested interest in the outcome of who must be SARS commissioner. And we, there's a litigation process where we are going to prove that there was nothing transparent about the appointment of the current SARS commissioner. And, 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 and outside of the litigation, which we're involved in, we should, as parliament, talk to what should be the process of appointing a SARS commissioner? Like, why can't we bring into existence the system that we use to appoint a public protector or auditor general? Like, let, let's have parliament involved in selection of a suitable candidate for, for position of a, a chief revenue collector in South Africa, because uh, there are so many vested interests in terms of who just occupies that position, particularly with the current powers that a commissioner a, possibly has. So it's one of the things that must be looked into as part of the legislative uh, interventions that we should make as parliament. So instead of the broad framework that a president will appoint a commissioner and then he goes to appoint a committee to secretly in a interview a SARS commissioner, that is problematic. Let us have a transparent parliamentary process of shortlisting and, and interviewing a potential uh, SARS commissioner and then we'll take it from there. I think that will be much more sustainable. But also there has to be clarity in terms of uh, the reporting lines of, of a commissioner. I'm, I'm more inclined on 
the option of having a board of SARS, like a much more effective board that will oversee the functions of a commissioner. So if we legislate that, it would mean that parliament also must be involved in selection of that board. And of course, later on appointed by a president, like is the case with all other major appointments. But there has to be a board because you would know that there was an incident before where there was no clarity of the reporting lines of a SARS commissioner, whether it's the minister or the appointing authority, which is the president. I think it's the same difficulty which characterizes the relationship between directors general uh, with their ministers and, and, the, and the fact that those are appointed by the president. So there must be clarity in terms of the reporting lines, but air board will be much more adequate instrument and mechanism to oversee how a huge institution like SARS is managed. And that, that I, I propose that we should take that option as opposed to an inspector general who will, will, be, will just be one person. And, and, and there's a difficulty with responsibilities that ultimately lie with one human being and, and they, they can always be a problematic. Now, the other issue, which I don't know why it's always closed over or it's not given attention, particularly with the current commissioner, is the issue of SARS perennial incapacity to address tax avoidance, transfer pricing, and basically all these sophisticated methods to erode the tax base. And all these reports that were given here from the Cards Commission and from what the, the Davis Committee has dealt with, a variety of things have always pointed to this phenomena of transfer pricing. But there's not yet a believable plan on how this is being dealt with. Like the, 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 there are so many concrete, like undisputed evidence that we are losing billions of rands of potential revenue due to transfer mispricing and, and all these tax avoidance systems that are implemented by multinational companies. I'm, I've, I've not heard anything believable from the current uh, SARS commissioner in terms of what is to be done? What do we do with this massive uh, transfer mispricing that is eroding the tax base in the manner that it is? And that, that, that gets worse when, when they, they, there's still no capacity and no clarity in terms of how do we collect the revenue from the e-commerce and digital economy? We've, we've made promises here that there's going to be a special presentation. We're still waiting for it in terms of what happens. We understand the multinational character of collecting revenue from e-commerce. But what, what is South Africa doing? What are the proposals that you want to give to the international multinational space to say that this is what, multilateral space, to say that this is what we should then deal with? Now, the uh, question which must be responded to is, what, what does SARS seek to achieve by recalling the Skakane report and the KPMG, KPMG report on the rogue unit? And, and it's not true that the Inspector General on Intelligence report is completely off the table because we are going to court to, to say that it must not be classified one, that it is still a legitimate report because the rogue unit existed. Whoever can say what? There was an element in SARS which this current administration is trying to close over and, and trying to hide. There was an illegal component and element in SARS which was involved in illegal activities. That is why Ivan Pillay and Johan van Lechenbeck were arrested. And there was a solid case which was mysteriously withdrawn by the current NDPP. But the reality of the matter is that there was a rogue unit and there is no one who has yet presented an alternate clear uh, uh, dispute to the fact that there was a rogue unit which was hounding people and spying on people illegally. And that is what the, 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 uh, the former head of intelligence is asking to present in the Zondo Commission. And if that is presented, everyone else will realize that what SARS is doing is just to drive a certain narrative which they sponsor journalists to, to report as if there was no rogue unit. There was a rogue unit in SARS which was involved in wrongdoing. And, 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 and whether you withdraw Skakane report, the KP, KPMG report, does not take away the fact that 
there was illegal activity in SARS and you are trying to withdraw all these things because you think that you will later on utilize your media platforms to dominate your narrative. It, it is not going to happen. We will be able to prove, even with credible witnesses who are working at SARS, that there is a unit that was illegally spying on people. It is still existing to this day. It harasses people. It spies on people for political narrow purposes. So this thing of SARS being utilized for political purposes is being used. And this explains why we had secret and untransparent interview of the current commissioner who is continuing the agenda of the cabal in SARS. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay. Thanks, Sir Bushbaum. Finish your concern. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was a uh, uh, slow son pegleb. Uh, because to uh, I think we welcome the presentation, the honorable chair. Uh, both from the National Treasury and, and from SARS. Well, one question still remains. I think the question that you raised at the beginning, Honorable Chair, that uh, how do we synchronize uh, the recommendations of uh, these var various uh, uh, commissions and, and, and committees? Because uh, I think. Uh, Mr. Momonia, I think, well, he gave us the, the background of these uh, various commissions, starting from the Franzen Commission of 1969, coming to Arts Commission, up to Nugent Commissions, and their aims to say what was the aim of this particular commission versus the other. However, where we stand, are we now at this point supposed to only look at Nugent Commission recommendations and forget about all these other previous commissions and committees? Or are we supposed to, as we implement, or as we oversight the implementation of Nugent Commission, we have to also look back at the recommendations of other commissions like the Cards Commissions and, 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 and so forth? How do we? synchronize that particular process as we deal with the uh, uh, Nugent Commission uh, recommendation. The second point, uh, part of the recommendations uh, uh, which have been highlighted I think by Mr. Momoniat, which have been made by the Nugent Commission, the issue of the establishment of an inspectorate to enhance governance of SARS as it provides a mechanism to provide oversight over SARS functioning in order to detect abuse in a manner that protects SARS primary mandate and taxpayers' confidentiality. So I want to know as to how far is the process, that process of appointing an, an, an inspectorate or an inspector general, because I think it's a very key office uh, to play oversight uh, 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 to SARS? Is it perhaps a uh, part of the recommendations that uh, will be implemented by next year? Because I think he made mentions, uh, especially in relation to legislations that were likely to see uh, legislation coming to parliament and stuff like that. So the issue of appointment of the inspector general, uh, how far is that particular process? Are we likely to see it happening next year or, or what? Uh, thirdly, Honorable uh, Chair, the SARS Commissioner, I think, has indicated that in total, the uh, Nugent Commission has made 16 main recommendations. But when you, you, you split it into sub recommendations, there are 27. However, he said that 10 of these 27 recommendations falls under the mandate of the national treasure of which one of them it relates to issues of procurement of the procurement policy and the other nine relates to matters of governance of sars so 10 which which all in all is 10 recommendations that falls under the mandate 
of, of, of the national treasury, which then, uh, in, in terms, if, 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 if my arithmetic serves me well, we should remain with 17 out of 27. If we say 10 recommendations falls under the, uh, 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 the mandate of the national treasury, it means SARS should remain with 17. However, he says uh, the, uh, they've, got, uh, they've got 19 recommendations that falls under SARS. Uh, so I think in terms of my own arithmetic, it should be 17, not 19. Uh, now, in one of the, the recommendations, which I think is the last recommendation, which are, which are those, the recommendations that are still in progress, it says that uh, they are going to recruit uh, former employees. Uh, well, I'm just want to know, is that not going to compromise uh, uh, SARS? I mean, to have a recommendation in black and white that says we're going to recruit uh, former employees. Uh, when you look at the labor laws of this country, well, I know that the intention is good uh, because some, I think, were fired uh, uh, without following proper procedures. Others had to resign because of the situation that was there at that particular time. But if you've got a, a, a recommendation in black and white that says we are deliberately going to engage in a process of recruiting former employees, uh, what do the labor laws of this country says about that? Is that not going to compromise us an, as an institution? Uh, we find that other people would feel that uh, this is an unfair labor process wherein uh, advert are made, uh, people are applying, but it is already known that you know these posts are reserved for former employees. It's only former employees that are going to be employed. I just want to know that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, thanks, I'm sorry, just Kosane. Uh, Honorable Lewis, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Chairperson. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure always to listen to this team giving presentations. I always say that uh, amongst all the bad news in th that's happening in South Africa and the really terrible states that our economy is in, it is great to see that at least some institutions in our government are still making progress in the right direction and not in the wrong direction. So, you know, I, I, am, I do have a high degree of confidence that SARS is slowly but surely heading in the right direction. That does not mean that there is uh, not still a great deal of work to be done. We might be on step number 25 or 30 out of 100 steps that need to be taken in the right direction. But the, the point is that we are heading towards greater integrity, greater transparency, greater rigor and application of the law without fear or favor. And I would say that when, when uh, people react very negatively to that and try to fight against the progress that SARS is making, I think the motives for that uh, should be very clear to us all. Uh, so thank you for the presentation and, and well done on the progress that you are making. I just have two questions which I'd like to address to you. Uh, I suppose this is to the commissioner. We have for the last two years in budget speeches heard uh, verbal commitments to allocate additional resources to SARS. I just went back and looked quickly at the MTBPS of 2019, and there was a billion rand allocation over two years, 500 per year. And then there was another additional small allocation this October in the MTBPS. So I'd like to just ask you to address directly, please, what, uh, uh, you know, what, what is the exact nature of the problem that you are talking about? Because it does seem that there has been an additional allocation. Is it that it is woefully inadequate uh, or is it that it follows a greater reduction in earlier years? I just, I just want you to set out that in a little bit more detail, please. Uh, I do agree though with the analysis that this is cheap money. Uh, and you know, if we are now paying after Friday's downgrade, 
we, one expects that we will be paying higher to uh, on on borrowing costs then it makes sense that you you allocate uh, resources for raising of additional funds where those funds can be raised at the cheapest possible price uh, and and it, it's a no-brainer that that is in additional revenue from SARS right now rather than from debt uh, so I agree with that uh, analysis I suppose then my question should also not only be to the commissioner but also to the deputy minister and maybe he wants to comment on that funding question as well please uh, then following on from that, this is a question I think for the Commissioner, is there is a noticeable decline in South African society around compliance and uh, you know what is referred to as, as tax morality. I'm sure that you can see it in your own life. I'm sure that everyone in this committee can see it in their own lives when you go to coffee shops, when you go to restaurants and other shops and so on. There's an increasing number of places where you notice cash prices and credit card prices differing, uh, cash discounts and so on, uh, one really does feel that there's a crisis of credibility, not at SARS, because SARS is heading in the right direction, but just the continuous assault of uh, corruption stories uh, coming out of, out of the coronavirus lockdown, coming out of the PPE scandals, coming out of Zondo and so on, that are shaking people's confidence in the in whether I am making a valuable contribution to society by paying my taxes or not, and whether I can't do something better with the money. Uh, so this is a huge, ex actually an existential crisis for SARS, uh, because you can't ever meet your revenue targets uh, in isolation. You know, you, you have to meet them in a context, in, in, a, in a particular social context, where tax morality and compliance is on the decline. And I wonder what Treasury and SARS are doing to work together to try and address this issue. Uh, and, and I'd like you to please give some comments on that. It's not just about tightening up enforcement. Of course, that is part of it. Uh, but, but I think that's actually uh, a, a relatively small part of it. And so I'd like you to, uh, both of you, if you can, to give comments on that. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Honorable uh, Louis. Uh, over to you. Uh, okay. Over to you, Deputy Minister, National Treasury officials, and uh, SARS Commissioner, to respond to the clarity seeking questions from the three members. No, you go, uh, May I ask uh, the Commissioner in Momo to? respond and then I'll come later. Or any other? Uh, Thank you. Hmm? Go ahead, Commissioner. Thank you, Deputy Minister. Um, thank you, Chair and the, and the um, members who have uh, raised the, the issues. Uh, Chair, uh, I will uh, obviously not comment on uh, the appointment of Commissioner. Uh, safe to say that uh, I continue to do my work um, and uh, will do the best I can until I'm told that I shouldn't be doing it anymore. The, the issue of, of uh, the functions of SARS are set in law. Uh, SARS does not wake up and decide what it wants to do, how it wants to do. Um, I am not going to respond to all of the uh, the issues around um, a so-called rogue unit narrative, but I want to make a serious request to any of the members on this committee, or for that matter, any other member of South Africa who is listening right now. If you have evidence of any wrongdoing at SARS, it would be the most responsible thing to do to present it to us. If we then don't act on it, we are complicit. Until such time, we will continue to do our work without fear, without favor, and without prejudice. I cannot be distracted by any narrative that makes suggestions about certain prevalences at SARS 
without presenting us with the evidence that it is so. And to, to, to suggest that there are members at SARS who have this knowledge, I would like to uh, also to, to have that knowledge because uh, it would serve no purpose for us to harbor criminals or to harbor anyone who seeks to undermine the important work that we have to do. I wanna give this committee an unequivocal commitment that as the commissioner of SARS, I am not aligned to any agenda other than the mandate of SARS. I am not working and I'm not beholden to anyone other than the mandate that is cast in law and that which I can do in good conscience. In terms of what is SARS doing as far as transfer pricing and, uh, and international taxes, I want to just also say here uh, that can we do more? I am the first to say we should do significantly more. And in fact, I want to share with the committee, I mentioned earlier, that we will soon be, in fact, we have completed, we are rounding up the report of the work that we have done in the last 12 months by SARS and uh, the team with Judge Davis to point out exactly the areas where we believe there is huge revenue leakage. But we are not waiting for the report before we are doing anything. I can therefore tell you that SARS has designed a compliance program that identifies all of the areas of non-compliance. And to date in this current year, the revenue that we have collected from those activities um, is over 90 billion rand. Specifically, we have conducted 53 base erosion and profit shifting audits. Last year, we raised 6 billion assessments through this activity alone. And our year to date, we have raised 3 billion of assessment. So I want to give the, um, the committee the assurance that to the extent that we have resources, we will leave no stone unturned to do the work that is required of us. And we will continue to report as we do in our annual report. And when this committee invites us to do so, um, to, to, to come back and to share more detail in that regard. I have requested, and so I, I, I am, I am uh, and this will probably only be next year given where we are chair, but I have in the previous uh, uh, engagement with the committee said, I think there is probably uh, the need for a session on its own and maybe after the release of the Davis uh, tax committee, the tax gap report, it would be a good time to come back to this committee and tell you the work that we need to do, both in terms of aggressive tax planning and non-compliance, uh, as well as the illicit and criminal activities. I really think it warrants a session on its own. Um, on, on the issue raised uh, of the recruitment of former employees, uh, I think, uh, the, the Honorable Masana is, is very correct in saying that it is not without its risk. But again, I want to give the assurance that uh, we will be always be mindful to balance the need that SARS has with the capability that an individual would bring balanced against any of the un unintended consequences that may otherwise be so. But at the same time, I want to say, we have to follow our conviction because the re-engagement of a former employee, uh, and unfortunately we live in a country where there is mixed narratives 
uh, we will never be able to make any appointment that will bring pleasure to all of the constituencies, uh, regardless of, of, of what narrative uh, they advance. And so we will be guided by our conscience and where there is a sound basis on which to re-engage a former employee, uh, we will follow the law, uh, but we certainly uh, will do so if it serves the best interest of SARS. Um, the, the, um, the issues on funding, um, again, there, there is a number of slides that I've shared. I won't go back to the slides, but suffice to say that uh, you have to look at the funding trend. Uh, and, and, and maybe I will share one slide um, because that, that does make the point uh, better than what I could make. Um, if you give me a minute, I will share that slide. This slide says that in, oops, in 2013, the funding at SARS was nine and a half billion. And then you can see progressively um, 9.4 the next year, 9.3 the following year. Then it went up to 10 point, uh, 10, to just over 10, then 10.2. Then it dropped again to 9.8 and then to 9.5. Now, the numbers mentioned in the minister's February report, uh, October report last year of a billion rand over two years gets lost when the final numbers are allocated because the base is no longer correct. The base was um, downward adjustment uh, around about 2013-14 by one and a half billion rand and then never corrected again. And so in fact, the, the increase in SARS in nominal terms uh, is almost flat and in real terms have in fact declined. Um, and so I think the occasional announcement about an additional money has to be seen in the context of the broader funding trend that SARS has as also by the fact that at one point when you are in a building phase, your, you would expect your revenue, your, your budget allocation to be between one and 1.2% 1 of your revenue that you collect because you're building uh, uh, infrastructure, you're expanding, you're modernizing. In a normal maintenance phase, you would expect that to be at about 1%. Uh, SARS has dropped down to 